Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the monthly show. On this show, I have to give a little spiel at the very beginning of all these shows. Uh, I created this show years ago with the intention of helping people analyze their own games. I believed then, as I do now, that that is the key to chess improvement. I also know from personal experience, both as a coach and a player who's trying to improve, that it is the most difficult thing to do, to analyze your own games. So, my intention with this show is very simple, to help people do precisely that. And um, here is a list of our table of contents of the people we have on the show today. And uh, while you're staring at that, I just want to say a couple things. Through the years, what we've seen, and this was beyond my hopes, honestly, when I started the show, was that people have not only improved their chess via making submitting their games to the show a habit, but if you go back and look at any of the archives on chess.com, if you just Google my name in the forums, you'll find many posts going back years. You will see people uh, really going deep in their own analysis of their in their analysis of their own games and you can see from month to month the improvement in the annotations and you know there's a a saying in writing that clear writing is clear thinking and a lot of that comes through in chess annotations if you can write in words what is going on in a position it really means that you have ex you, you have understood it at least on a deeper level than you did before when it's kind of a mucky muck thing in your brain okay so let's move into it and um, we're gonna start with a very interesting game I'll come back to this table of contents now and again a uh, very fascinating game that we started with. And um, first of all, I want to mention there were two games that were submitted for this month's show that had uh, games were played over the board. And this was one of them. Stefan's playing in uh, Austria. And then the next one we're going to look at is down the line is Dor, and he's playing in Israel. So... It's kind of unimaginable that chess is going to be played over the board, at least where I am. You can barely even still travel outside of your own state. Um, but it's cool to see that coming back, at least in other parts of the world. Uh, and so we have two from this show. We'll see how many we get next month, hopefully more. Um, it's still, I guess I should say, on the tables. It's hard to imagine it's going to happen. But the National Open in Vegas, where our very own Kostya Kavutsky was at least talking about playing months ago, that's still technically on. I have find it hard to believe that that will actually take place. In any case, uh, let's get into this game here. And um, what I've done is you can see the player's annotations up there on the right. And I really tried to, um, you know, make it as big as possible so that people can see what... Is being written. I, I really do think that the value of this show is that is the annotations of the players themselves in seeing their own thoughts. And regardless of whatever level of player you are, you can see that regardless of your level, you can write about chess. You can write about what was going on in your personal view of the position. Another thing I should add on that note when I review these games, I do not use the computer. So, um, you know, there, there's several reasons. One of it's selfish. It, it's not interesting for me that much to look at what the computer says about these positions. But most importantly, I feel like I want you to just gain a sense of how I see um, your game. I don't want, you know, you can turn on the computer. Fine, you know, I encourage you to do so. And if anything, my my pro tip is that you should look at the game uh, on your own, hope, preferably with a, a nice board, and then turn on the computer. 
uh, if you're going to turn on the computer. Uh, just so that you can formulate your own thoughts before the computer starts showing you a lot of weird lines. As we'll see in a lot of these annotations, uh, a lot of annotations contain computer lines, and that's mostly okay, though I'm going to hint at a couple points where I feel like the computer did a disservice to the annotations that were made. Okay, so in this first game uh, by Stefan, it was a you know, I always picked the game, I don't know, that resonated with me the most. And this one was very interesting, besides being over the board, in that it contains a thematic sacrifice uh, that I had the potential to play in my last over the board game that I studied deeply. It took me three episodes, actually, of my uh, Road Back to 2500 show that I do normally every Wednesday when I'm not doing this show. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit when we come to it. All right. So we're going to get this famous Briar variation going back, oh, I don't know, at least 100 years. And there it is. And I like it a lot. Um, one thing that we should just note is if, if this looks weird to you, knight b8, d7, uh, it's not just to free the bishop on b7. It is also to fix the knight, because when it's on c6, it's dominated by the pawn on c3. So we're just trying to get a more harmonious setup for black. Okay, bishop c2, rook e8, knight f1, bishop f8, knight g3, g6. This position has been seen many, many times. I was an e4 player as a kid, and I can recall having this position loads of times as white. Um, several different moves are possible here, um, and all kinds of newfangled research has been done. And white plays b3, and we're going to see that the intention of this move, I think, is that white wants to at some point play d5. And then, after d5, if challenged by c6, to support the pawn with c4. Uh, and whether good or bad, that is going to set up the fantastic thematic sacrifice that we're going to get in the game. So let's just say white is the one who now chooses the course of, of you know, how the game's going to look by playing b3, bishop g7. Now, one thing, Stefan's saying he's still in prep. One thing I have been greatly impressed by, I guess you could say, is the level of uh, preparation that players um, who, you know, are, let's say, below 2,000, or even below 2,200, the, the, the length of preparation that uh, I've seen in these games is just astonishing to me. Uh, we're going to see in the next game even a deeper example. And um, I'm going to use this thematic sacrifice to talk a little bit about openings, because I do think that Stefan's uh, sacrifice was the result of him having understood uh, or seen it in positions that were at least uh, similar. Okay, so d5. If that was sound at all like gobbledygook, I'm sorry, I promise I'll come back to it. Rook c8, and now bishop g5, and Stefan writes, introducing nuance into the position. Now, his opponent rightfully says he has no idea what's going on. I mean, most people, they get to this kind of thing, and they're just moving pieces around. Uh, we're going to see, though, that getting black to play h6 plays a role in the coming position. Okay, so... Um, you can just imagine that he could have played bishop e3 instead of bishop g5. Okay, here we go. c6, very thematic break. c4, knight b6, queen e2. Now, let's say some obvious things. The problem for black 
is that the bishop on b7 is biting a wall on d5. And um, it's not, both sides honestly have trouble figuring out what's going on. What is the plan of the position? For example, white has really a king's Indian structure now. It's really transposed into a king's Indian structure. But because black has already gained space on the queen side, it's not really clear how big of a deal that's, what, like what could he do over there on the queen side? Now what he is doing is dominating some of black's pieces and that's more than enough. Black also though, uh, in contrast to a king's Indian or like a king's Indian, he, the, the f5 is very hard for him to achieve, the f5 break. It's just not set up in this position. The rook's misplaced, the bishop's looking at that square, yada yada. Let's just say, let's just list them off. Bad king's Indian bishop, dominated knight on g3, unclear where that guy's going. This guy's a victim on the, the c file. Both of these pieces, funny, so loads of bad pieces. And so black is going to go for it now with this monster uh, idea. Whether it's good or bad, I'm going to let you guys decide. I think it's very interesting. Let's take a look. Snip, snip, snip. There it is. Snip, snip. Okay. Really interesting question whether or not black has compensation. Now, um, in the, I think in Stefan's mind, it's basically like balanced, and that might well be true. Um, maybe that's what the computer says. I think it's, for me, a very interesting, just because I, I know I'm not sure about this position, because I'm about to show you a position I had in my own game and analysis where uh, without the computer's help or anything, I had a hard time being convinced that black had compensation in a similar position. So, um, yeah, really interesting thing that, let me just, let's just talk a little bit about the opening. So it's a, what we have here, right, is a thematic idea. And it's the kind of thing that, when you're playing an opening, you want to have it as part of your arsenal, this kind of thing. Can you do it, for example? If you imagine the pawns on e6 and d5, there's comparable sacrifices in the French that I've done as well. You'd sac sack the piece for those two central pawns. And the first thing I have to say about this is you should judge whether or not it's correct to the extent that your central pawns are dominating your opponent's pieces, right? So for example, the pawn on g6 is already dominating the knight on g3, and the pawns on h6 and d6 are dominating, and e5, are dominating the knight on f3, right? So how big of a deal is it? Well, it all comes down to the domination, and if it is a big deal, that the bishop is uh, under fire on c2. It's a unlucky piece. Now, one thing that's interesting to me about the position is that it certainly wasn't forced. Like I took some time and I was like, okay, what would I do? And for example, you know, something like this comes to mind. And I don't know exactly what's going on, but I, I feel at least kind of reasonable about Black's chances. You know, and like a lot of these Rui positions, you know, it, it's just a big strategical fight and it just lasts forever and forever. So, right, one of the interesting things right away, right, is it's not a forced uh, maneuver for Black to take on C4. We have an interesting question in the chat. Did this come from a King's Indian? And no, it came from a Rui, but as I mentioned before, it is uh, very similar to a, it is a King's Indian structure. Okay, I am now, let's do a compare and contrast. I'm gonna show you the position I had. Let me flip this. Um, I was black in this position, and the notes are mine, and white has just played bishop c3. 
which seemed odd to me. It seemed really strange. And like I said, I was analyzing this on the show, on my own show. And uh, Josh Riddell, GM Josh Riddell, who does a lot of streams, you can check him out here on Twitch, um, was just hanging out with me. We're analyzing. And he is, by all means, an expert on the Rui and Briar structures. And interestingly, he said, well, knight takes e4. And I got to admit, in the game, uh, it didn't cross my mind, really. <laughs> it didn't cross my I'm ashamed to say it didn't cross my mind, knight takes e4. Okay. So, you know, we... He, we and by the way, he was, you know, confidently said it without really going into variations too much. And one of the tricky things about sacking in this way is that uh, the variations sometimes just will end up confusing you. Now, hard to analyze this kind of position, first of all. Um, but what I came up with in just my own uh, analysis. So let me just mention, so I I spent weeks on this game. I really think going over a game like this can be amazing for your chest. Spent weeks, and anyways, after we did the show, I still hadn't turned on the computer or anything, and I said to myself, oh, 92, 92, and I'm just not sure that uh, black has enough in this position. And for example, if you take the bishop here uh, I didn't, I wasn't thrilled at all with this because white will now have very good chances to win the battle of the battle of the blockade of the light squares with his unopposed bishop on g2. We're going to see a similar thing with the dark squares in our game today. So if we give it up, can, if we get the two pieces for the rook, can we win the battle of the blockade squares? Huge question comes up in our current game as well. So then, you know, I analyzed it without the computer. F5 was my thought. Rook H4. And, you know, I spent some time here. And what's very interesting to me as a player is that in this position... In terms of my analysis, right? This isn't sitting at the board. This is me just in the leisure of my own room, this room, thinking about the position. I had difficulty feeling that I had enough in this position. And, you know, I took it to Josh and he also was like, oh, I don't know, maybe maybe you don't, you know. Maybe you don't. And in hindsight, this is important for our present game, I should just be confident and play a move like h6 or knight f6 with the just general feeling that because several of white's pieces are dominated by my central pawns, that, uh, in particular, that terrible rook on h4, what is that thing doing? That I will have enough. Is it impossible to really analyze fully? Yes, I think it's impossible. I think it's impossible to analyze fully. But you're playing for space, and that space really is all about not just like rolling, not just rolling the pawns, but about dominating the miners, right? All these pieces are bad, and this guy at the very least owes me a tempo to get out of that uh, weakened square. Okay, so that's why this game, Stefan's game, is so interesting to me because I feel like I had a similar deal. And now let's compare. So his game goes C takes, C takes. Let's flip this. Chess.com, by the way. If you are listening, chess.com, I don't know what happened, but it used to be that you could um, go to a board and, and, and it would stay flipped, and now I have to reflip it. In any case. Here's our position, and Stefan gives his opponent's next move a question mark, and I want to say I have a, at least some sympathy with this move, queen d2. In Stefan's mind, he's taking the bishop on e3 no matter what. 
And if I was white, of course I'd be worried about knight c3 followed by like d5, d4. That would be on my, my, my definitely my list of being worried. So, right, when he writes rook a c1 being better, I have, you know, assuming we, we plugged it into the computer, I have no doubt to um, doubt you, no reason to doubt you, but right, the some kind of knight c3 thing, you know, scares me. Not saying that, it scares me. But obviously you're saying something like queen d2 and no problems, and that's probably true. We see the first instance, by the way, of where this pawn on h6 is a little bit of a victim. We're also going to see that uh, this bishop has trouble getting out. All right, so a very human move, queen d2. And my, my word to the wise from having analyzed positions like this and played a couple is you should, like, let's say you turned on the computer, maybe you even had the position kind of sort of on, you know, on the board, as it were, or on your computer screen. And the computer would tell you yada yada, and might give you some evaluation. You should just expect that in a real game, it's going to go differently. Like, someone's going to play queen d2, and that probably is not even on the list of computer moves. But when you look at it from a human standpoint, it's of course... Uh, very natural. Okay, so here we go. Knight e3. And interestingly, like, Stefan doesn't question this at all. And I guess he's right, but to me it's like the, the confidence that Stefan has in this position, I thought, is really interesting. And uh, it goes back for me to what the way Josh Friedel just did it. He just took and asked questions later. And yeah, that's fascinating to me. That's absolutely fascinating to me that uh, black could have such a range of, a degree of faith in this position. Okay, so um, F takes E3, and that is certainly the move I would have thought of as well, just with the hope of that pawn kind of slowing down the uh, rollers, the, the pawn rollers on d6 and e5. In this position, I want to say I would likely be very frightened as black whether or not I had compensation. A key detail of the position I wanted to mention. White's biggest problem really is that black has an unopposed dark square bishop. And that is the wrecker that um, White has before him, this incredible bishop on g7. And the next moment, let's just say right now, is the big critical decision for Black. Um, let me just say, with my human eyes, I'm just looking at it with human eyes, uh, I don't, I, I would guess. Right? I would just guess, no, that black doesn't have enough. And I think on that score, I'm wrong. You know, I was wrong in the game I actually played, and I think I'm wrong now. I think black does, in fact, have grand compensation. Okay. Now, Stefan's next move is wrong, uh, but it's very thematic. And let's talk about why it's wrong. First, this is the moment to start thinking concretely about using the dark squares. And one thing he rightly notes is that if this pawn were on h5, then ideas of bishop h6 would just be much more powerful and ideas like d5 followed by bishop h6 threatening d4 would make d5, would give d5 more sense. Okay, so let's look at first the human variation that Stefan gives. And it makes a lot of sense to me. Bishop f3, gf, e4, and um, this definitely seems like compensation to me. Um, and let's just say bishop e4, and the notes, actually, Stefan gave some notes here I didn't understand. He said queen g5, king h2, bishop e5. I, I didn't understand that because of f4, but... 
if we just look at, say, the position with bishop a1, rook a1, I think it's a good example of the rooks being better than the two minors. Notice that the knight is poor on g3, and also that we own the c-file, and that our king is substantially better than our opponent's king. We are actually, I didn't plan it this way, but we're going to get another example of two pieces versus the rook in the next, uh, in the next game. Okay, so that's, a, I'm going to call that the human way of playing against, in this, playing this position. D5, the move played, is also a very human move. Um, now let's show what the computer told Stefan. E4, knight D4, and let's just say the obvious. Unless you saw something amazing uh, against knight D4, you would never consider this because it's giving away this dark square blockade. But this is what the computer sees. Bishop takes, you cannot play queen takes because of the bishop. I'll repeat myself. One of the reasons why this position is playable for black is because the bishop on c2 is a tactical victim. e takes, e3. Again, you can't take because of the bishop on c2 being a victim. Queen e2, queen h4, king h2, and now b4. A very computery variation, but one to appreciate nonetheless in the sense that what Stefan says is true, that black, that white can barely move. We've got him on complete lockdown. The bishop is gorgeous. This rook will probably, you know, can land on c3 whenever he wants. And notice that we didn't take the pawn on d4 because that would liberate uh, the white pieces, though someday we might take the thing. So again, like if you were looking at with this with human eyes and you saw this, on your horizon, you might not trust the fact that you think you're better here. I'm, I'm not sure I would, but you know, you know, with the computer's help and with a little bit of experience, you can say to yourself, right, I'm, I'm learning how to play some deep chess here because in fact, this is an example of a position where black has complete domination. Very interesting for me. Okay, so d5, and we should expect that both players are going to have, make mistakes and probably time pressure is going to slowly creep in. So, rook a c1, and a very nice move by Stefan now, h5. I like it a lot. Doing two things. Maybe I'll push the g3 knight back with h4, and more importantly, my bishop can come to h6. Let's say something obvious. The two bishops are amazing. They're always amazing. But, uh, yeah, the two bishops combined with those two extra pawns give black some compensation, even though I now, I, I still, it, it, just from my human eyes, I believe in the white position. Okay, now a strange move, e4. I don't know, let's not call it strange. It's actually very human to try to control... Uh, to try to take away some squares from the, um, to try to create a blockade in the center. Um, just a human move, I think, would be get, get out of dodge. Just get out of dodge and then see what happens next. Okay, so um, e4, e4, f5, wow. Now this is technically a mistake, as Stefan points out. He should play h4 first but a really powerhouse move to play f5. And uh, the simple idea, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't call it simple, but is that if we can force e4, your knight isn't going to be happy on the blockade squared knight d4 because this bishop is unopposed, and then that thing's coming. So this is a very beautiful idea. And I forgot to give my whole rant on the opening that I was going to give. So, me and Kostya Kavutsky, who, help, who helps me host the Chess Dojo site, we have this ongoing debate uh, where I have a student 
who doesn't know his openings are pretty undeveloped, but he's about 22, 2300. So it's kind of rare to see someone at that level have very have an undeveloped opening repertoire. Obviously, he's played a lot of games and has some sense of some positions, but no deep knowledge. Not like Mitch, who's coming up next. And so the hypothetical question is, how much would it, how many points would it be worth if someone were to sit down and give my student uh, a really deep opening repertoire? And... Costa's first answer was 250 points, and I was like, oh man, we have a real disagreement on our hands. So, um, from my sensibilities, in some ways, it's better not to have a developed opening repertoire. And the reason for that is, especially in today's modern life, it's very easy to find your past games. So, for example, if I show up at a tournament and I can look up your games, well, I can I can play at least a variety of different positions if I don't have a stable opening repertoire myself and um, get a position that I like just by using your past games. Now, the downside of that is precisely what I showed in that other game is that I didn't know about this amazing sacrifice with destroying the two central pawns and definitely didn't feel intuitive to me. So I think the reason for an opening repertoire, this thing I'm really driving at, is it's not so much the memorization of moves, but if you have some deeper ideas like Stefan has here, which go beyond just um, taking, but look at this move F5, that is a man on a mission. When you're playing a move like f5, that's some that's some real chess. Um, right. Anyways, the debate between me and Kostya goes on. I think it's not that big of. I think even at my level, which is let's call it the weak GM level, openings aren't that important. But what we're seeing is, and we'll see this in the next game too, especially if you know what your opponent's going to do. The opening, knowing what position is going to come on the board. In advance, that's a huge advantage. Okay, so f5, a inaccuracy, h4 first is better, as noted, let's say, because you got to go knight f1. If you go to e2, then we can take on e4. e4, queen b6, e3, and it's all, it's all downhill from here. Look at that. Very nice variation. Okay. So f5, snip, e4, knight d4, queen b6, knight e2, exclam, makes sense. Now the knight can go back to e2, and as promised, we now have this position where um, black is fighting the dark square blockade that these two knights are fighting for. Nota bene. This bishop is, for the moment, a terrible, terrible piece hitting the rock on e4. Okay. Now, as we might expect, white is under a lot of pressure here and now makes a mistake. Um, Stefan notes there are many good moves here for white, and the simplest is queen g5, just preventing bishop takes d4. And really, this is a bummer. For black. There's no good way to break the pin. All kinds of pawns are hanging. Not, not what he wanted, right? Okay. He catches a break. Bishop h6, queen d1, and now a very uh, instructive mistake. The dark square bishop is a massive, massive piece, and Stefan gives it up. Why is it massive? Because of the dark square blockade, right? Now you got your rook and you still have some pawns, but the dark square blockade being lost means that his knights are now incredibly strong and your bishop is toast. Um, we're going to see actually the next game, again, I didn't plan it this way, a mildly similar thing where the, the next player, Mitch, cashes out by taking uh, a rook. It's slightly different, but it has a similar feel to me. 
Um, Stefan mentions rook f8 as being much stronger. And right, once you have a deep feeling for the dark square blockade, that's when you can say to yourself, oh, right, right, I, I do not want to move that bishop. And when you look at white's terribly cramped business, it's really hard to come up with a good move for him after this very delicious rook f8 move, where black, I, don't, I would rather be black, you know, clearly. Look at those bishops. Amazing. If you, and of course, the goal strategically is not only to create some tactic to win, but to break this guy, break the blockade. Okay, bishop c1, and now unfortunately, it all goes downhill. And let's say the obvious, when you play this kind of chess, it's, it could go wrong. And now the big bummer for black is his king is just floating, floating out there. All right, game ends pretty quickly here. Check to the miserable king. Mate next move. Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right. This, we got two games, by the way, uh, coming up here that were played on the Chess Dojo, from the Chess Dojo server on our, uh, we have a round robin going on. And <clears throat> Mitch, let's flip the board here won the first round robin, and that was mostly players in the A player or expert category. And so since he won that tournament in such fine fashion, he, we, you know, the dojo said, this guy should play up into the master round robin. And uh, he acquitted himself well. I think he scored an even score against mostly masters, so many of which are very uh, strong and ambitious. <clears throat> and here is a great example of preparation. Uh, so Mitch is an example of a guy who has gone really, really deep in terms of opening preparation. And if someone wants to fight me on my claim that openings aren't that important, if they want to fight me, then they should point to Mitch as an example of a guy who consistently gets good positions out of the opening, almost always anyway. And part of this, though, what, what I've noticed with Mitch is it's not just that he studied a lot of openings, but that he does deep research on his opponents. So in several of the games that I witnessed, he was able to correctly predict what opening would occur and what position would land on the board. And like I said before, if you can do that, that is a bigger deal than even knowing a bunch of opening theory. If you have if you have an hour before your game or more time like Mitch had here, uh, you can really learn a position. Okay, so here he goes. And, you know, it's hard to say what Mitch's uh, playing strength is. I think he told me he's only like 1900, but when you see this game, it's like, oh my God, at, at the very minimum GM level for, I don't know, the first 20 moves. And his opponent here is Mike Fellman, who I believe is around 2200, something like that. So here we go. F3. Okay, now the first thing I want to say is, um, this is very popular, of course, I was thinking about this game a little bit, and the I, and F3, I, it's interesting, I was thinking about it for myself, is I'm allergic to this move a little bit, and let's just say the, the idea, obviously many strong players have played this move, and there's nothing objectively wrong about it. But the, what's interesting is that... Um, Obviously, you are not developing your guys, and F3 is ultimately about space. There's a lot of ideas, like maybe G4 later, you know, dominating the knight on F6. Ultimately, though, right, it's the domination of the black pieces that is going to help to justify white doing this F3 move. So, um... The position we get, I think, will be the kind of thing that often happens when you play ambitiously for space, is that you're just not developed. Okay, so let me show you what happened. C5, very standard business uh, these days, 
And one thing that's funny is before this game, I think actually on this monthly show, at least once, I said something to the effect that learning this variation for white, where you trade queens and rip a pawn on c5, I said was a good practical choice if you really studied that ending. I think technically it's roughly equal. Black definitely has compensation. But I said, if you study that ending, you would uh, have a good practical advantage because there are ideas involved. And most black players, those most black players are not Mitch, haven't studied the uh, variations in the same level of depth that Mitch did. And like I said, Mitch very much had predicted what uh, was going to happen. So here we go. Knight GE2. Now, before I show you what Mitch played, um, one reason I like this position for white, in a way I still do, I think it's very interesting, is black has the problem that at some point you are going to have to deal with this very annoying Knight D5 move. The easy way of dealing with it is to play E6. At that point, however, once you play e6, your bishop on c8 is a problem. Okay. In addition, uh, and we're going to see this in this game as well, the dream of white should be that his king hopes to be better than the black king. Now, what I mean by that is it hopes to control some of those entrance squares from the black pieces to stabilize the position. Now, of course, that could all backfire. The king could turn out to be a victim, and that's part of the debate of this variation. Okay, so here we go. This was Mitch's prep, b6, bishop, b7. I like it a lot because this enables us to play the e6 move without our bishop being stuck, and... Um, it allows a connection of the rooks in that way. And furthermore, what we're going to see is that in many, many variations, Mitch is intending to play f5 to help break this guy free. And that is, it is a major problem. And let's say the obvious, the, these pawns are trying to say, yes, it costs me a lot of time to do that, but I control space. I control the bishop on b7. I control the knight on f6. Okay. Um, Mitch gives just this huge data dump that <laughs> we see here. Very interesting. Uh, and let's go through it a little bit just so you get a sense of what these variations were that were going through Mitch's mind. And what you can see in all of these, really, is that uh, Mitch is aiming for this kind of position, and the compensation is all about the uh, rook on h1 not getting into the game. And so it's really a question, if the rook somehow got, gets into the game, then the king is going to be better placed on e1 and will be up a pawn. Variation goes on from here. Another one, knight f4. I think that might have been my first instinct as white. So let's look. e6, rook d1. Just calmly playing, and you get this square. You're just consistently making it difficult for white to castle. Look at this monster variation. And then, I don't know. Black is, at, black is at least okay. Again, so a long-term compensation that goes into the end game. And note, now the king on h1 is the loser of this game, where it is now poor and owes black some time. So here we go, knight d7, knight d5. And here's the practical advantage if you know what's going on before the game. He's already, bitch has already got a 40-minute time advantage. All right, let's play some moves. E6, knight e7, knight takes, bishop takes. Even this position Mitch had in his prep. And the move in his prep is honestly, to me, pretty funny looking. 
and that is to play rook d c a. That it was a hard move to kind of remember. So I think Mitch's move definitely makes sense to me, especially like I said from a human point of view. Um, one variation I want to show actually that'll help us understand how Mitch approaches the following position is uh, this one over here, let's say h4, trying to get the rook active. And, oh, excuse me. Uh, right, excuse me, wrong, wrong variation. Bishop e2, c4, a5, f5, and we're breaking things open. There's also, let me show one more. And this whole, yeah, this whole thing with the h pawn. It's funny, I was looking for F, never mind, never mind, I take it all back. Such a morass of things that you can see, it's even hard for me to navigate it, and I'm not even playing it. This move that Mitch played, totally the human move, okay? What I was trying to show was that there were several variations in his prep where this GF5 was played. Uh... GF was played. It's funny, I was, I was just looking at the variations and I saw GF in the other variation and so I thought it was going to be this idea here. Me and Kostya were watching this and uh, live. We were, every Sunday night we have a thing called Sunday Night at the Fights and we cover at least a couple games, or try to, that are being played in the dojo. So you can sign up on our Discord server for one of these games. We have a ladder as well. And we'll try to take a look at your game live as, you know, in addition to whatever other game is going on. So we, of course, didn't really appreciate that Mitch was still basically in his prep. And um, it was just stunning to us that GF was played so quickly because EF certainly looks like the human move where we're going to be looking to play some kind of rook e8. Now, interestingly, the gf move certainly has its place, though it's, you know, anti-intuitive if you don't know about it. Uh, by the way, here, we're looking at uh, Stefan and Mitch, two guys who are not GMs, playing some deep opening concepts here, right? It's like, I feel like I'm in a new world, just how the level of depth of the opening preparation of both of these guys. Okay, now, um, king f, or excuse me, b3, king f7, bishop a3, rook d8, bishop e2, knight c6, and now, as an example of a practical you know, how this could have gone practically for white is if you imagine this position with bishop c1 that definitely white should have played, um, well, anything can still happen. I certainly believe that black has compensation and Mitch gives these variations, this variation here, I believe black has compensation, but of course the pawn is meaningful and, you know, the king and the the king and the rook are starting to stabilize. And so the drama for black in a position like this would have been finding ways to continue to harass the white pieces before they achieved coordination. And um, that's, of course, just a skill in itself and a skill, of course, for white as well to um, avoid being dominated. Okay, so... White makes a mistake, bishop b2, and it certainly has to do with the fact that, that Mike, Mike Fellman, who's playing white, was down to like a minute, you know. And this is what happens when, you know, your opponent's just busting out some deep moves and you're just like, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God, what am, I, what am I supposed to do? Okay, rook d1, king d1, bishop b2, King c2, bishop f6, and let's stop here for a moment and say, yes, black is definitely winning this position, and we're going to call this phase two of our analysis today, in that um, Mitch now uh, 
plays superficially at a number of points and in particular uh, starts moving way too fast. It's definitely a weakness we've seen in other of Mitch's games that he's moved too fast. And something that Kostya and I have seen from other players on the dojo as well is when it comes to endings, uh, we just see that players are moving much, much too fast. And my own personal sense as to why that's happening is that people think that endings are somehow simple. It's amazing to say, but I'm pretty sure that's what's going on. Like, they think that the moves they're playing are just obvious. And if once you've studied opening some, excuse me, ending some, and have experienced, especially endgame study-like positions, ending tactics, you got to say, no, that, that, no way. <laughs> no way can that be true. No way can that be true. All right, let's put two more moves and we'll talk a little bit more about why I think white is completely lost in this position. First thing we should say is oftentimes with a rook uh, and a pawn versus two minors, you are fine. You know, in fact, you, oftentimes you're even better. Uh, with the rook, it, in particular, if the rook is able to penetrate into the black position. The rook, let's just say, here's a great uh, rule of thumb that I like. Uh, the more the position opens, the more the rook plus pawn or pawns has a chance of being better than the two minors. For example, imagine a position out of the opening. Those positions out of the opening, the rook is mostly meaningless. It doesn't have the files to operate. But as we get to more and more of an open board, that rook can be... It can approximate more and more to the power of two pieces. Okay. So, um, here, a crime happens. Knight takes e2, and Mitch played it pretty fast. And what he did was he made this judgment that the bishops were just winning. Now, it turns out that on an objective level, that turns out to be true, but it wasn't, well, I'll just say for myself, immediately obvious that it was going to be either easy or true. Whereas, if he just plays e5, honestly, any move, I don't see any hope, any hope for white here. The, these guys can't move. This bishop's terrible. There's constant... Um, Threats of things like e4 and really rough for white to do anything. So, knight takes e2 and, the, yeah, there's a sense, a lot of times, for example, let me give a, an example of how sometimes people think. Um, I'm, and everybody's done the following mistake. You're ahead in material and you trade down, thinking that, oh, that's just what you do. Now, in general, it's true you want to trade down when you're up in material, but in a case like this, your knight was so much better than the bishop. Oh my god, so much better than the bishop. And the knight was helping take away squares from the white rook. Okay, so here we go. Mitch was still moving fast. And now here, the very interesting position here, by the way, um, I, first of all, I was so offended during the, our broadcast of this game. I was so offended that uh, Mitch took on uh, took on e two that I was like, "Oh, White's White's fine." In fact, no, White's not fine, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, and and I'll, I'm going to give a shout out to Costa here, who actually schooled me in the analysis, where uh, if this were Bishop and Knight then I think white should be fine. I do believe that. But the drama here, and Kost, this is the, the thing that Kostya schooled me on, is if you just imagine, think about what's going to happen in this position and say the pawn is going to e4, then you say I can cover both black and light square blockades, and then you say to yourself, right, there is no way to stop 
the bishops from attacking all of the future blockade squares. Further, if white tries to use the only advantage in his position, which is to potentially get a passed pawn, what it turned out in the analysis that me and Kostya did is all that does is it helps the bishops get more access points to those squares <laughs> that we're going to try to remove the blockader from. <clears throat> the blockader being the king, and sometimes the rook, but mostly the king. And then, of course, you get a pawn. The rook sacrifices itself for a pawn and a bishop, and then you're left with a winning technical ending. Still takes some skill to do, but definitely still winning. Now, one thing I want to say, in terms of, I know a lot of people are out there trying to improve. Uh, when you see that Mitch plays quickly here and that he blows this, it should encourage you to say, oh right, uh, the end game is where I have a chance not only to beat Mitch, but other players as well, because I'm not going to be, you're not going to be beat Mitch in the opening. Forget about it, buddy. Don't even mess with him over there. Um, and this kind of position is not the kind of technical position that you're going to get in the Dvoretsky manual. The Dvoretsky manual is very important, uh, and you can learn what I think are algorithms, how to finish off the very end phase, maybe, of a position like this. But the beginning phase of this position requires uh, just some experience and some, to, to my, in my experience of these positions, some basic practice in thinking about good pieces and bad pieces. So, for example, the trade of the knight on d4 for the bishop on e2. If you can stop doing those kinds of things and just focus, like I said, on the most basic level thinking of what needs to happen in the end game, then you will become a monster. And then you can maybe take on Mitch Fabian and try to get him in an end game position. Okay, so uh, as Mitch writes, definitely wrong headed. The more pawns that we trade off, the closer we come to a draw. Uh, Kosi and I studied this a little bit. We still thought that this was winning, but of course it starts going wrong. And even here, I think we still said it's probably still winning, but it's getting hairy. White, of course, just wants to trade things off, and that's the final crime. F takes E4. F takes E4, imagine this pawn, it doesn't, it's hard for that guy to actually create any drama. And the simple thing that black is going to be aiming for is, as we said, this uh, instructive thing where the black bishops can start nailing any of those squares. And because the board's so open, it's hard for white to shut down the diagonals to those blockade squares. Okay, bishop E4. And now things peter out to a draw. And, uh, yeah, not much to do. You can win that pawn, but right, this is a blockade position. I would have tried forever to play on. Mitch says he shouldn't. It, it was a waste of time. No, I, I'll say for myself, I would play this on until the end of time. I love massaging out positions like this. But I am going to spare the broadcast from this, uh, the rest of this game. Are right, we going to come to Vishnu? Actually, let me check in with our uh, table of contents here. So we have two endgame scenarios, both arising from the Sunday night fights. That's what we're going to go to. And there you see the future that we have in store here for the rest of the show. All right. Oh, now, I may, I was about to make my standard mistake where I go back to the analysis board without flipping to uh, the other scene. This is Vishnu's game against Quirked. Kind of like the last one, Vishnu is around Mitch's level. Um, and here he's playing somebody who I think is around 2200. And Quirked is a guy who famously, uh, his, name, his, his real name is Sam, and list 85 is Vishnu's handle famously likes unbalanced positions and can be very dangerous. So b6, I'm going to call that a slight inaccuracy. And maybe Vishnu even knew that this was coming. 
it's uh, an inaccuracy because it's the only variation that I know, only plausible move I know for black where this next 92 is, is dangerous for black. Because after bishop a6, we get this position, and this is a, it's an advantage for white. Maybe nothing that severe, but let me just say the Nimzo Indian, it's very hard to get an advantage against the Nimzo Indian. Okay, d5. I actually had a game like this recently myself, and the point is to play b3. Um, it's a very delicate move. It's a nice move where it does two things. It shuts, the aim is to shut this bishop down, and this is going to be important for understanding what happens later in the game, for getting this guy out. Uh, this happens in a lot of Nims and winning positions where we steal black's dark square bishop, but our own bishop on c1 is not yet active. Uh, the dream for white, though, what should be clear is that the dream is to say uh, that we want that bishop out, maybe even a4 at some point. And a key tactic I'll just mention for Vishnu's benefit is if we do something like this, there is no taking on c4 because b4 is the end of the world. If knight b7, we win the piece. Knight b3, c6, b5, we win the piece. Knight b3, actually this is a good example of what we were talking about before, uh, much better to have the miners here, my friend. Oh, man. Oh, man, much better to have the miners here. Note that the rooks just aren't that important yet. Okay, so here we go. Um, in the, the game, we had queen a4 check, queen d7, maybe c6, snip, 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 takes, knight takes. And here, you know, I always give Vishnu something to beat himself up over, and his next move is something I, I want to, yeah, I want him to remember. Um, let's say white has a couple obvious problems and black has a couple obvious problems. Uh, it is not, black's main problem is not the pawn structure, by the way. And I think maybe uh, black was, white, white i.e. Vishnu was obsessing over a little bit. When I was a kid, I really want to stress this, when I was a kid, before I realized that pawns weren't people, I felt that this was just a great deal for white because he could conceivably get a better pawn structure with b4, b5. In fact, black's biggest problem is that his knights... Uh, need fixing. They need fixing. White's problem, this guy, the beautiful bishop, also needs fixing. And a lot of the game going forth has to do with Vishnu understanding that that bishop needs to uh, get some freedom. Okay. Castles. Now here's the one I want, <laughs> I want Vishnu to beat himself up over. Whenever this is just anybody, it's a good red light for them to have in their mind. Whenever you are in some kind of ending like this, you want to question any kind of castling. In general, yeah, I mean, sometimes it's correct to castle, but usually you go, yeah, rethink the castling. Rethink the castling. And, uh, Vishnu makes fun, trolls me a little bit here by talking about how much better I think white would be after f3. Um, and I do think f3 is the right move. And the main point, though, is we're going to play f3 anyway. To dominate this guy, to put the pawns in the opposite color of our bishop. But the main thing is our king probably doesn't want to go to g1. There's no reason for it to go to g1. Probably a square like e2. Okay, castles. C6. For my taste, I would like black to play C5 because now he can ask white some just basic questions about where he wants to put uh, the bishop and the pieces and black's king is better, the rooks are faster over here. So C6 gives white some time that I'd rather not give him. 
f3. Gaethje, again, I'm, it's not terrible, but it's not clear that the rook belongs there. I'd rather be fixing the knights. Uh, Kostya makes a good point of always saying, harping on the idea, that this knight should come to d6, and I think that makes a lot of sense to me. You could begin with knight c7 as well. Just not clear that the rook is necessary on rook e8. e4. I think this is the right plan. Right. And uh, one of the reasons to play c5 earlier is to make this kind of thing difficult. Knight e6, and Vishnu's right. He uh, says bishop e3 would be better really keeping the tension. Now, one funny thing about Vishnu's annotations is... You know, when you do uh, a computer analysis on uh, chess.com or Lee Chess, it'll say things like, inaccuracy, bishop e3 was best, you know, or something like that. It'll give you a little happy face or whatever it does. And a lot of times those things are misleading. Um, and we should, be, because they don't tell you why, right? And... The, the thing that we should bear in mind, and this affects very much the, the next mistake that Vishnu is going to make, is we have a dynamic here where the bishop is going to strive for open positions, hopefully with passed pawns on either side of the board, and the knights are going to strive for blockading positions. And I think... If Vishnu had that endgame theme in his mind, and again, let me just repeat what I said with Mitch. If you get good at this kind of position where, where me and Kostya are watching people play really fast moves as if it were simple, when it's very deep and difficult, then <laughs> you have real chances to improve your rating. Improve your game makes it more interesting as well. So that's the kind of truth of the bishop. And e5... The sad thing with e5 is that you're also putting, in addition to creating a potential blockade situation with the knight uh, holding down that square, you're putting the pawns on the opposite, or excuse me, on the same color as your bishop, which is going to inhibit that bishop's scope. And when you played e5, you really killed off this knight, who has at least some pressure over here on d5. Okay, bishop e3, and uh, Vishnu is absolutely right. Knight e7 would be the right move here. f6, and let's think about it. Why is f6 wrong? Because in general, white wants to open the position. f4, and now uh, a mistake, fe. Now, um, very interesting moment. And Kostya and I were watching this, and I think once you have an intuitive feeling for the needs, let's call, them, call it the needs of the bishop, there's going to be more examples of this coming up too, you will sense that you want open play with pawns moving on both sides, and that intuition will at least encourage this move. I hadn't thought of it as a theme, but we're seeing a theme of the show, our, our two rolling pass pawns in the center. And of course, a, a lot of players' minds, and I think I would have, this is, would have been myself, it would be true of myself as a kid especially, is it's easy for the mind to shut this move down, to not consider it, because you know, you're worried, first of all, about a fork on d4. Thankfully, we can play rook a d1 against that and you're worried about those pawns rolling. But like I said, once you have the idea of the bishop, its strength, then that's when you would naturally at least be able to consider this move. Okay, so here we go. Knight c7, oh, excuse me. Right, knight c7 would have to be played or something if he wants to play c5, which is obviously not the happiest thing. Okay. Uh, and by the way, you know, he gives knight c7, Vishnu gives knight c7, rook a1 as equality. And, you know, maybe that's what the computer says, but honestly, I would, I, I would say white is better because the, instead of rook a1, you could do all kinds of things like rook a d1, and it's very difficult for black to, to do anything. 
and the, the tactical chances are all whites. Again, if I, I'm just trying to say if I had looked at it without the computer, I would say white is better here. All right, rook f8, b4. And the interesting thing about b4, it's not wrong, but you are putting, again, the pawns on the dark squares, which makes me nervous. 97, and now g4. And you write bishop f2 was best. Now, I think that might even be the computer saying that, inaccuracy, bishop f2 was best. But, of course, bishop f2, you know, not the most intuitive move to see. G4. And now, <laughs> I, I, I can't tell if it's was the computer saying it or you, but you write A5, mistake. H5 was best. Sounds like the computer anyway. Um, right, H5 would be a very ambitious move. Uh, it would take some coconuts to play it because in a certain sense, what he's potentially allowing you to do is just open the board up more. So, you know, it would take, yeah, like I said, some nuts to play it. But obviously he's fighting for the blockade square of f5. g4 f feels natural to me too in the sense that you need to get your king involved. Okay, a5. Vishnu says all these things like mistake, h5 was best for the computer after he had analyzed it himself. Okay, so he tried to make knight a4 work. Didn't seem like anything was going on. So he played b5, and the computer wants c takes b5. And I'll just say from a human point of view, I would much rather be thinking about c5 as well. And now it's all going to come down to how do you feel about knight a4? Well, let's look. Rook takes, rook takes, rook b8, and now some interesting mistakes. Takes, takes, and now bishop c5. Now, Vishnu calls this a blunder. I don't know, blunder's a little too strong. But definitely knight c5. And let's use this example, this variation, to illustrate what the bishop's about and just the intuitions you should have in the ending with the bishop. Rook b5. Now, of course we're dreaming about rook f7. And the other thing is the reason you might spot the following nice move, which maybe the computer found for Vishnu, e6. The reason you might find it is just intuitively your mind should always be searching for putting the pawns in the opposite color as the bishop. Every single variation, that's what you should be looking for. And e6, very powerful uh, move. And watch what Vishnu says. King e8, knight g6, bishop g7, rook b3. It's this whole long line. And in fact, it's way too long. Because really, from a human point of view, you can end it at e6. You can say, oh, right, well, we're done. That's the move I want to play. In any case, the reason I wanted to go through this whole long thing is that Vishnu writes at the end, here are some computer lines that illustrate what it takes to draw. No, <laughs> no, let me disagree. There's no taking to draw here. The game is fully, fully lit. Mistakes are still going to be made on both sides. We're not looking to draw here. Anything can still happen indefinitely. If I was white, well, I would have no idea what the actual evaluation is. Well, I would be optimistic, if anything. I mean, I'm the guy with the bishop. I'm the one with the long-range piece, and this is just not no longer in any way a blockade-type position uh, where the knight might prosper. Okay, let's look. Quirk now uh, plays a nice series of moves to get the advantage. King e8. Now, this was, again, like their computer. I love it. It's a mistake. Knight c8 was best. We actually found knight c8, I believe, me and Kostya, though it was not, I mean, it's really a pretty hard fi find. And king e8, especially if you're in mild time pressure, preventing rook f7, is going to be, uh, your, you know, the first thought. So here we go. Knight f4, 
king f1 and things are definitely going downhill here um, and again the way to find the correct move here is always to be thinking about putting the pawn on the opposite color of your bishop so e6 and the bishop becomes stronger uh, as well as preventing a lot of the garbage of this knight who has to now come back to take the pawn. Let's do a little dogmatism here. Uh, let's count it out. The knights, by the way, if they are in this little boundary line, they control a maximum of eight squares. Let's count out Vishnu's bishop. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You could argue he has scope onto that square. So just a massively stronger piece in the open position. And especially when it's complemented by other pieces, like the rook and the knight, who will help the control of the light squares, that's when the bishop can really prosper. Okay. A sad uh, move that is passive, and passivity in the ending is definitely... Uh, a crime. Uh, knight d5, now e6. My guess is that black is winning this position. Rook f3 is a nice check. And even though king g1 is best, I, I don't believe that white is going to sur survive this anymore. And there it is. Okay, very nice game, very instructive, and I, one thing I did, I'm going to give a shout out to it, uh, a video I did. I did a, a thing called an opening repertoire for black, excuse me, an endgame repertoire for black. It comes out of an opening. And the idea actually was to create a scenario where you would often get an ending um, that are a little bit like these ones, these last two. So you would have practice in playing them and develop a certain level of comfort in playing those positions as well. Okay, let's move on to our next game. I've known many Polish guys named Masie. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. I googled it and finally learned that's the Polish version of Michael. And he plays this variation that when I was a kid, everybody said it was wrong. But I recently uh, read this book by Nikitin, who was Kasparov's coach about, and he was writing about his bro, Vasyakov, and Vasyakov played this variation as white a couple times in the book, and I thought it was pretty, it is pretty spicy. So, knight c3, knight takes, pawn takes, beautiful pawn sacrifice, honestly. This would be a position very easy to learn, so especially if you're an attacking player. And the point is, if bishop c5, Queen g4, you have compensation. Uh, in the game with the Vasikov, we had a very interesting struggle where black played knight c6 to induce knight f3 so that there was no queen g4. And I'm saying all this because that gives you a sense of why black played queen h4, which is to, with the hope of preventing this bomb landing on the king side. Where, where white is going to be stronger. Okay, queen e2, knight f3. And uh, Masia writes, queen h5, I'm out of book, and that queen e7 is probably stronger. Um, yeah, really interesting position. And let me just say, from a human standpoint, queen h5 would certainly be one of the moves that anybody would, I think, consider. And now we have uh, uh, one of these fascinating positions or question of like, well, what should white play? And um, yeah, I, the more I looked at it, I was like, oh yeah, this is a powerful position for white. This is the real thing. And the reason is, is that queen is unstable on h5. So um, again, I haven't looked at any of these positions with the computer but my instinct for white was g4. And basically, I think he's going to have to, at some point, take the pawn, after which we will play rook g1 and penetrate into not only the position, but our side of the board. And what I mean by that is, like, this pawn on e5 really gives us 
the space on the king side, which will make it difficult for these guys, all three of these miners and the other pieces, to get over there. And notice, is, well, black is a long way from Castle. Long way from Castle. It wouldn't surprise me if there were other moves besides g4, maybe h3, some other move like that. This move seems wrong, and interestingly, uh, Masia writes that he felt he did this out of space. And I think, yeah, what it's going to do is, when the bishop moves, it's no longer going to be a loose piece. And although it's not clear how white's going to like use a tempo on this loose piece, in a tactical position like this, it can definitely fall off the board. Further, that pawn on c3, yeah, it's kind of, I don't, I don't want it. I don't want to loosen my position, especially if I want the option of g4. I want uh, maybe the possibility to maybe castle long as well. Anyways, b4, bishop e7, castles, and uh, d6. And Messia correctly says black should play d5. Um, d6 is a very normal move for an alakine player, I'll say, because they that's their standard operating, operating procedure in a lot of these alakine variations. As we'll see, though, white's development is so large that black shouldn't be helping white open the game uh, by, by, scratching, by scratching white on e5. And uh, Messiah writes d5 much better. And then, you know, we can imagine, actually, let's look at this for a second. In a position like this, that what we have is really a French structure. I'll give another plug. I did a, a video called An Easy System Against the French to Make Them Squirm, something like that. And some similarities to this position where we gave up a pawn for the initiative and... Uh, what I want to mention, though, is in the French, black is playing on the queen side. His pawns are pointing that way. And so it makes me nervous and dissatisfied with the move b4 because maybe he can use that to help create some lines for himself on the queen side later. Okay, so d6. Not an obvious mistake, by the way. You know, it's only only when you really start thinking about the activity of the white pieces and the inability, therefore, for black to open the position that you say, oh, right, not good. Knight c6, very simple and strong. And look at this. We've got this amazing ending where we got to say white is for choice, as they say. Okay. Bishop c7, you cannot take on c3 because of rook d8. So, castles, c4. And a uh, very nice position where uh, we're going to have two endings here, by the way. Uh, another one kind of similar to this and with a queenside majority. And the question is going to be, well, how do we feel about it? And it, it's... Right on the edge, I feel, this one between holdable for black and lost. So let's look at how it goes. e5, bishop f3, Masia gives double exclam, and at the very least, I do like it. Bishop e6, bishop b7, bishop c4. Now, white could certainly consider rook f e1, but let's look what he does. Bishop a8 takes... King f1, rook a8. Great. And what we have here is a transition from an attack to the ending. And I think what we should realize is an attacking player, anybody out there who's an attacking player, this is the kind of position that you're going to want to feel comfortable about converting. Now, Messia doesn't say anything about the next move, but I think it's a big deal uh, that white plays now b5. I think it's a mistake. And um, basically, let's talk about white's advantage. His rook is better, his bishop's better, his king is better. 
And where do we want the rook? We want it to live. We want it to live on the second, on the seventh rank. And um, with b5, we're allowing black to get enough time to get his king. And notice that king is very important, very active in the defense of the d7 square. So at least with my human eyes, when I look at this position, it looks winning to me because I don't see how black extricates himself or extricates that rook on the seventh. If you ever win that pawn, by the way, man, oh man, is they, they are both rolling, both rolling. Okay, so let's call that a, a big inaccuracy with b5 because now king f8, king e2, King e8. Let's read what uh, Messiah writes. I was expecting that uh, black wants to triple everything on d8, but that would exchange my active pieces for his passive one, and his king is closer to action. Right, I think that obsession with the trade on d8 is big um, in understanding how you thought about the position. Uh, what ELO time controls is this. I don't know exactly the ELOs. Uh, some, uh, let's guess around, I don't know, 1800 or something like that. And I believe this was, uh, oh, I was about to say this was a real event. I don't think this was, my, excuse me, I shouldn't say that only uh, traditional over-the-board events are real. What I meant to say is that um, this is, I think, a uh, game online. I think it was 30 plus 30, if I my memory serves me right. As I mentioned before, I'm hopeful that we're going to get more over-the-board games in the weeks, months to come. Uh, quick shout-out, now I'm talking about it. The next show will likely be, it's usually the last Wednesday of the month, so we're looking probably at the 30th, and I will post a link there, or we will post a link on the chess.com for, chess forums where you can submit a game for that. Due to scheduling conflicts, we moved this show to be uh, a little bit earlier. Okay, so this one's right on the edge of being uh, drawn for black. Right up, real close. And the problem is that the rook on a8 is coming to c8, and it's hard to imagine... Uh, how we prevent it from becoming active. All right, bishop d6. I thought that was a little strange. And a4, let's read what you wrote. You said a4, just any move, and after which the pieces are exchanged. I don't get it, though. I don't get what you're saying. First of all, you can take on e5. And second of all, when we look at this ending that you talked about, well, hard to say exactly what's going on, but uh, I got to like White's chances. <laughs> I got to like White's chances. It's so hard for him to approach uh, those pawns over there. Yeah. I mean, I've, I, I don't know exactly what's going on, but I would guess that White is better. We've got the jump with the pawns. We've got the jump with the king. However, on a move like a4, the, my concern would be rook c8 followed by some other thing like that. So maybe rook d5 instead of a4, though again on rook d5 I'm concerned with rook c8 and then counterplay with rook c2. So like I said, this thing about the king getting to e8 was essential for black achieving uh, some kind of counterplay. All right, bishop d6. Good move, rook c8, rook c4, and now he starts losing his mind a little bit. Here he should be fine, but he starts losing his mind, and now we have a dirty trick. The guy needs to play rook c4. Bam! Nice move. Nice move, and now the rook is gone, and then uh, black is going to resign. So very nice ending, very nice rook trap, and Masia, I hope you can join us again on the show. And he's here, Mom, Mom Siek. All right. Nicholas has been on the show many times. And, uh, yeah, we, I think he is an example 
Uh, by the way, we have two Scandinavian flares coming up, not the opening Scandinavian, but from Scandinavia. And uh, yeah, they have both been on the show, Nicholas and Tim, many times. And I think, I'd like to believe anyway, that their game has improved by doing the annotations that they've done. Okay. Now, um, here's an interesting point to think about openings. Uh, Vishnu, the famous Vishnu, the same one whose game we analyzed just a moment ago, is famous for starting a Twitter war, a Twitter war that I very much enjoyed just observing from the sidelines about how the London will destroy your soul and make you a, not only a terrible chess player, but a terrible person. And where it can become a, a bad thing to play a setup like the London is if you dogmatically play the same thing no matter what. And I bring that up because Nicholas's next move is very much like that where his opponent's done a slightly weird system, and he should now be thinking about the move e4 instead of the dogmatic e3, where that's just part of his setup, right? When you play this Tory thing, which is in a lot of ways very similar to the London, you are just intuitively going to reach for moves like e3 without considering your options. And that's when you really can become both a terrible person and a terrible player if you repeat the same thing just because you've done it over and over again. It's like your hand is doing it instead of your mind. Um, maybe I'll just mention that what's interesting to me about this position is, first of all, Nicholas says that it's equal. Well, I would like to believe in white, but one thing where it's certainly true is I'll show this variation. Um, bishop g5, e6, e4, h6. This has happened many, many times in GM, super GM play. I think it's called the big center variation. Oh, look at that. They even call it that. Chess.com calls it the big center variation. Um, and even though it feels at first glance like this is an advantage for white, it does to me anyway, it's difficult to actually prove anything if black keeps the center closed and tells white that his unopposed bishop is going to be a monster, even just goes back queen d8. Very hard to actually do anything to the black position. Okay, so here we go. e3, bishop d3. Knight bd2, bishop e7. And here I think uh, Nicholas makes a point that I really like. Uh, arguably, the, this next mistake is one that has to do with playing by rote. He plays the natural castles. And when you play positions like this, London players have a similar problem. Is Sometimes you can get to a position that you feel stale, and you don't know what to do. And every player's had that experience. Nick, uh, Nicholas is going to have that in a couple moves. And the trick is to find the levers of the position where you can do, uh, you know, you create a little bit more drama. And I love what Nick, the variation that Nicholas writes in here is that 95 would have been, he says, a stronger move. And at the very least, this would have lit a fire under black where... He's, by the way, he's saying with knight e5, he says, Black, you have neglected to play knight d7 in time, and now I'll play f4. And what you can see in this position is white has achieved a stonewall structure where instead of the bishop being on c1, it's now on g5, and it will get out. And the dream of Frederico the f-pawn here is that the rook is going to come to f1 and will be developed in one move here and play a role in both the potential attack on the black king and also just a crimp in the center. Okay, so that's a nice point. And you'll see, you know, like the, the point is not just that that's an interesting and fun position for white. It's that later, white's going to have, find it hard to find a plan. 
because now 95 will have a lot less force because you'll have to take it back with the deep one. Okay, H3. Now, H3 is funny. It's like the first indication that white doesn't really know what to, to do, right? And I totally sympathize. I've been there. Castles, rookie one. Nicholas doesn't like this move, but it's hard. It is hard. It's hard to know what to do now. Like for me, queen e2 comes to mind. But that, that doesn't solve our problems. Maybe h6. I, it's funny. Like maybe the bishop wants to go back to f4. So maybe not h6. But here, black is definitely okay. And uh, the variety of different moves he can do. The next move, I just want to admit that I don't understand. I don't understand bishop c6. I couldn't begin to tell you what the idea of that move is. Queen e2, 94, and c4. Breaking his setup and... Um, Nicholas criticizes this move, but I'm sure that he was provoked by this weird bishop on c6, and it feels like we need to do something to at least, you know, give him the business for putting his bishop on c6. So I have a lot of sympathy for the move c4. Okay, so knight f6, as Nicholas writes, many options, and now boom, Boom, and I like what Nicholas says. In this position, rook a d1 would be nice. Uh, and it's just a very typical thing that can happen in a position like this when you're better developed that the queen uh, becomes a victim, the black queen, because it's not clear which square she should go to. Okay, so instead we see queen c2, e4, takes, takes. Okay, let's read what Nicholas writes. The opening moves of this game have been below par by each side, with many strange decisions on the way. However, and this is very much true, we have arrived at a typical position that warrants a deeper understanding. Close to symmetrical, uh, and a quick glance should conclude that if any advantage for either side should be detectable, it would be minuscule. Okay. One thing I want to say about this being a topical position is there are many variations. Uh, Queen's Gambit accepted, um, Queen's Gambit declined, where white plays for this kind of deal. And it's a very uh, prickly thing to understand, in my experience. Because at the moment, the pawn on e4 is dominating the knight on f6 and the bishop on b7. But it's also dreaming of playing e5 someday to open up the bishop on d3. And so if anything, it's like black wants, black has to deal with the threat of e5 hanging over his head. Okay, rook a d1, and Nicholas criticizes that move. To my mind, queen e2 is just the natural thing to do because the queen can't stay, to my mind, on c2. And the, the thing, the reason Nicholas doesn't like this move is that he feels that maybe it should go to c1. Well, maybe. Actually, I'll say one funny thing about attacking structures like this is the rook on d1 might regret being there because black can start a trade machine, in German we say an Tauschmaschine, on, d, on the d file. And that would detract from our potential to attack on the king side. All right, black very much plays a weird thing here. Um, Paul in New Jersey has a game, actually, where we get a bishop h6 and in instead of a bishop a6. And clearly, black is obsessing about trading off the bishop on b7 for the bishop on d3, fearing the bishop on d3. But notice, the bishop on d3, especially after knight e5 was played, it's not clear what the thing's future is. Right? It's only looking at the black king in the abstract. So here's a great move that Nicholas plays to create a little fire for the black pieces. Knight g4. Very nice. Uh, and now, again, black reacts poorly. e5. And what we have here is 
a position that reminds me of Messiah's position in that there's a, just a basic question. Obviously, white has the advantage, but does he have enough to win? And in this position, I would say yes. Uh, in addition to the pawn, black's rooks and bishop are a little bit funny. I, I want to temper that optimism I have, though, about the white position just by saying this isn't, it will not be easy to win this position. May I just take it back? I <laughs> take it back. Oh, let me just take it back. After b5, white is definitely for choice, but okay, if you were going to claim it's winning, it's obviously some story about the d file and yada yada, but it's it really will be hard to win this thing. I'm going to say clear advantage for white. Okay. Now, one thing that I really remember from my early days of chess, before I understood some things about endings, you know, just before I had a coach or anything, I never really had a coach anyway. But I'm trying to say I had difficulties. I remember uh, very well that I had difficulties playing positions like this where white has to play a good ending and it's not the kind of ending you're going to find uh, in the books where you learn to checkmate with the bishop and knight. It's going to be something you have to do from practical experience. We have several endings like that this, uh, this, uh, this month. So watch what Nicholas does in the next two moves. It's definitely wrong, and he knows it's wrong, but let's talk about why. He's going to play b3 and a4. I'm almost certain that he doesn't say why he's doing it, but I'm almost certain that Nicholas does it with the notion that he is fixing that pawn on a5. Now, right by putting a pawn here, b3, a4. In this position, though, there are far more urgent things going on, and they all have to do with improving the king, the rooks, and preventing black from achieving counterplay, right? Look at those black rooks. They are just itching to come down to c2. And once black gets down to c2, even if white remains up the pawn, we should say that's going to be enough to hold the position, right? And it's just, uh, just a noteworthy thing, actually, when you're analyzing a position like this um, in a game, let's say you might have this position coming up in the next couple moves, you can tell yourself, oh, if I get play against the white pawns, like a rook on c2, I should be able to hold the position even if I'm down the pawn. So um, the moves that come to mind to me are, well, king f1 in particular comes to mind as a very reasonable move, where not only are we proving the thing, but we're going to make it difficult for the rook on c2 to uh, land with any promise. So, for example, we're ready to play king rook e2, for example. And we're getting out of the way of this bishop annoying us. And we're going we're gonna to wonder about what's going to happen next with f4. We might play with f, excuse me, with Frederick or the f bomb. We might play f3. We might play f4. Probably, though, we're going to just sit on it for a second and improve our rooks. Okay, b3, good move. By rook c6, I mean good move. Uh, snip, snip, bishop b4, right. And now I feel like black should be fine. Rook c1, could have played rook c2. Honestly, black could play rook c2 with hopes of maybe trying to win the game. You could Maybe maybe you should even start with the move f6 first to blunt the, the, the bishop on e5. Rook c2, black should be drawing this thing. And now rook a2 should be easily holdable, right? And uh, Nicholas gives this position as being equal. I don't see how it's equal, I mean, more than, more. I don't see how it's better for white. Uh, obviously, in some level, it has to be better for white because we have the pawn, but it's just, how are you ever going to deal with that amazingly strong rook? And notice the pawn on a5, definitely not a weakness. Okay, rook c4. Now Nicholas is going to use a nice ending trick to capture the black rook. And 
If Black had thought about it a little bit here, maybe he would give a check on rook c1, after which he would still be fine, and you'll see what the problem is in a second. He plays king g6, now the very nice rook c7 exclam, and now the rooks are coming off. And once the rooks come off, then that pawn on a5 will legitimately look like a problem. He should take the pawn, take the rook and start trading off pawns on the king side, but instead decides that he doesn't want to meet his fate, and that's just going to make this pin all the worse. And then now you can't even defend a5. So, all right. Who are these players? This is Nicholas and Lars. This is a game from Scandinavia. I believe, though, this was probably played online. Nicholas has a cool uh, online league that he's playing in. And here we go to Tim. Tim is also in Scandinavia. Though I'm told they don't know each other officially. This game is 30 with a 30 second increment as well. By the way, I really encourage people to, uh, especially, let's just say, for games uh, that you want to annotate, I encourage people to play a longer game, 90-30, for example. It will just give your thoughts a little bit more depth and more for you to wrap your mind around when you analyze the game. As I mentioned earlier, at the Chess Dojo, our Discord server, we've got a number of tournaments going on as well as a ladder where you can play 90-30 games. Uh, and as I mentioned also before, on the Sunday Night Fights, which we start at 6 p.m. Eastern, me and Kostya talk about the world of chess, but mostly uh, look at some games that are being played in the tournaments on the Discord channel. All right, Vishnu, good to see you. Here we go. And we got this beautiful uh, Petrov here. And one joke about the Petrov is that um, uh, is going to apply to the position that we're going to see. And the joke about the Petrov is, imagine the, the knight were here and it were Black's move. Would it be so bad for him to play knight e4? Right? So, the joke is, is that really, if white wants to claim an advantage, he has to say that the knight is poor. If the knight becomes strong, well then, oh man, there's no reason to think that black isn't the one who has the advantage. So, I'm not a big expert in this, but my understanding is bishop e7 is the more standard variation. But bishop d6 is certainly the move, if I was black, I would like to be playing. And as is typical, uh, you know, white is going to do something a little bit uh, scared like h3, and that's going to give black the time to go for it. And by go for it, I mean to try to keep the knight on e4. I, I'm going to guess that moves like c4 and knight c3 are probably what could be called the theoretical moves instead of h3. Okay, c6, now there's another way to play for what I'm calling the strong point of e4, and that's the theme of this game for me. And that would have been, you could still play rook e8 in this position. I don't understand what the rush for c6 is, Tim. Rook e1, rook e8. Rook e6, knight c3, maybe he should have played c4. Now you hit him with f5. And right, this is uh, an amazing position that has everything to do with domination, that white has to break the domination fast or suffer the consequences. So he plays bishop g5, and that doesn't feel right to me because um, the bishop is just hung out to dry over there, and your move is correct, queen c7. Rook c1. Doesn't make any sense. Knight d7, knight h4. Now, here, Tim, is a point in the game um, where I think, you know, you, you were saying that this felt like garbage, knight h4. Definitely doesn't feel right to me, though I have sympathy with the guy. <laughs> I have sympathy with the guy because it's not easy to know what to do with white. Clearly, with this last move, rook c1, he didn't know either. Um... 
uh, that that um, you should be much better here. And I think the move, the next move, if you understand it on a conceptual level, will help you uh, understand how to play this kind of position. So you play knight df6, and the bummer about this move for you is that the guy can trade. And let's say something obvious. What you have here is a space advantage, and you've got a bishop that's hung out to dry. You know, i.e., at some point, the guy, I think, is going to have to move the piece or take on e4, and both of those, you know, options aren't too great for him. So at least my intuition here would be to move this knight. Some players might go to b6, but to me, knight f8 makes a lot of sense. And I don't think he can do things... Like f3, I'm just assuming it can't because of bishop h2 check stuff. Looks like really hard to meet. Okay, so your opponent, though, promptly blows it. Boom, thank you very much. Game's basically over. All right, so the dream of the Petrov is, if you can, to hold the knight on e4, and that's certainly... And so that makes this game a paradigmatic example for you and other players who might want to play this way. Note to Bene, look how terrible this knight is, dominated by these pawns. Oh, man, what a, what a terrible position. Okay, one amazing thing about our next player, Doors, not only was this played in an actual game, i.e. over the board, but check out this picture I am there in the middle, if you don't recognize me. And Dor made this graphic for us at the dojo. There's Kostya on the left and David Proust on the right. So thank you, Dor, for that. And you can tell that's my pre-COVID haircut. COVID has set me free. I've always wanted to be a bald guy. COVID has allowed me the freedom to do it. And so I just shaved it off, man. I just shaved it off. No more barbers for me. It's time to move on from the barbers. Okay. So, let's get into this game. Um, now, it says door was white, but I'm pretty sure from the analysis that door was actually black, so just imagine that flipped in your head. So, here we go. Uh, by the way, in the notes, you can tell that door is traumatized by the London. And uh, there's a variety of systems to play against the London. Definitely not something to be traumatized by. So Dor tries to shake things up with b6. And um, let me just say, Dor, with your notes here, you say e4, d5, and I don't, I'm not a fan of that d5 move. Um, the thing to play after e4, I think, is bishop b7. And the bummer is, unfortunately, if he plays an knight c3, I think you have... Actually, even I, I still like this more. But anyways, if you play knight c3, what you can play is like knight f6, bishop d3, bishop b4, queen e2, d5. And if e5, then you always have knight e4. And on, um, let's say, instead of knight c3, probably more testing bishop d3 and knight f6... Queen e2, right, and this, I'm going to say, is better for white as well, but it's not maybe that big of a deal. We're going to get something like that. So, one um, thing we should say is that when your opponent plays bishop f4, it's in fact not a big surprise. We should say it's totally expected. Totally expected, because the London players... They're pre-programmed. They're robots. They're always going to do the same thing. Not always, but like Vishnu says, when it's bad for your soul, it's bad for your soul. And so similarly to uh, Nicholas's position, he had a chance for e4 and didn't do it because he was just like, his hands had already been pre-programmed to play the setup that he's going to play. Okay. Now, I classified this game as a Dutch just because it seems like it goes into it here. And um, I think, well, right. 
I think what you're motivated here by door is a need to mix things up. And there's, you know, a very simple move, of course, to play here would have been knight of six. And, you know, we have an equal dynamic game. Nothing's wrong with it for either side. F5, it can't be wrong, but it should be noted that the bishop on f4 works pretty well against this f5 Dutch stuff. And so blacks, white's pieces are set up pretty nicely, I think, for this structure. That isn't to say, you know, you're much worse or anything, but I think, yeah, this allows white some good chances, and he takes advantage of them. Good move. Good move. Uh, and we criticized him for earlier playing rope moves in a London structure. And I swear to God, I have London students who, hopefully they don't do it now because I've yelled at them so much, but who have literally played moves like C3 in positions like this. It makes no sense, but it's that's their shell, their little triangle that they feel so comfortable with. So we have to laud your opponent for um, playing let's call it outside the box, and this will allow his knight to become stronger as well. Now, this is a position where, uh, yeah, it's going to be very dynamic, and of course the move d6 is controversial because of that, e that tender e6 square that you have. So better probably to start off with uh, castles. d6, knight c3, and now you castle. Uh, I still think you are fine here. And I think what we should be looking for in this position is to play h6. And we could have, you know, played h6 at a different point too. Simply put, we need to prevent knight g5 because you want to play knight bd7, right? And you cannot play knight bd7 until you've stopped this terrible, terrible, terrible thing from happening. Okay. So what we get is, I think your move is uh, correctly motivated, and it's kind of elegant. I'll just point it out for people. The idea is to say, well, look, knight d7, and then I can drop back with bishop d8, and uh, it looks weird at first, but this bishop d8 maneuver has actually been played by loads of famous old-time Soviet GMs, including Tall, in this kind of um, Dutch. I for, I'm forgetting the name of this Dutch. This is so long ago that people even had a name for this structure where they played bishop e7. Maybe somebody will... I can't remember it. <laughs> I've got the cognitive decline. I can't remember what it was called. In any case, so, rook c1. Um, knight d7, and now he finds a great move, knight b5. And this is certainly something easy to miss, that this would be, I, I've missed moves like this, everybody has, where the point is that your intended move, bishop d8, didn't work to this terrible, terrible thing. Where the bummer is, he's got a tempo on the bishop. If he didn't have a tempo on the bishop, the knight would probably be lost. But now he's got that move, and you know the knight is either coming out or it's getting fixed forever with c6. So right, you had to go queen c8, and now it's just a question of trying to know how bad it is for uh, you. Now he plays c5 immediately, and it feels right. And you said he didn't maybe understand everything he was getting into, and that was probably true. But I mean, yeah, that's certainly the move that all, all signs point for white to play c5, right? The rook under the queen, the opening of the bishop, we could go on. All right, b takes, d takes, Knight c5, and here we are in the tactical portion of today, today's fiesta. And um, I think your 
right that rook c5 was more interesting for him. Let's take a look. Rook c5 takes, takes, and it's still, we want to say, really complicated though. I'm going to imagine rook b8 and I think, you know, I think white's doing well, but this is not, it's not immediately obvious. Not immediately obvious how we crack that point. Unless it is obvious. Let's see if it's obvious. Bishop c4. Maybe it is obvious. Because rook d8 we're just taking. So anyways, that would be the question for white. Does this win? And yeah, in a game you'd want to sit down and, and think about it for a while. It certainly looks pleasant. His move though definitely looks like a good move as well. And you say knight a6 is a funny looking move. It's definitely a funny looking move, after which the position is at the least unpleasant. So, yeah, I had a couple questions here. You write, first of all, that instead of knight a6, bishop f3, gf3, knight d3, Queen d3 was better. Now, this is, we got to say, still very unpleasant for black. So my question was, could you get away with knight d3? I'm not entirely <laughs> certain. Um, but the point would be that if queen d3, we're going to dream of maybe making this pin annoying. Maybe we can survive. So then it becomes a question of, can the guy play rook c7? And I'm not sure. But I yeah, this would this is my question for just the analysis of this game. It's like, I'm going to imagine, you know. Actually, there's all kinds of things still to consider here. Like, I could play bishop f3 now. I could play queen b8. If queen d3, I'm going to think about bishop a6. I'm threatening queen c7. Right. It's still, that's the position that I'm wondering uh, for black. Now, the theme that I put out there for this game was that white takes the bad piece. The bad piece? What is it? It's a knight on a6. The major part of white's compensation here is that the knight is absolutely miserable on a6. And we're going to see that white doesn't understand it. Again, just for the record, uh, door is actually black. And you know what? That was just a mistake I, I'm sure he did by putting in the game. So I'm going to fix that real quick. Let's do this. I know how to fix this. We're just going to switch this up here. And this is Jonathan. Spelled with a Y, but I blew it. Okay. But it's kind of interesting, actually, etymologically. Jonathan, of course, a Hebrew name. But uh, we pronounce it with a J sound now. But if you go to, like, Germany, it would be like with the, the way he spelled it with a Y sound, Jonathan. And uh, that's, I guess, the old-time thing. And my name, I guess, in Hebrew would not be Jesse, but Yessa. Anyways, what am I talking about? <laughs> Here we go. Knight A6, Knight D6. Uh, Bishop D6 definitely looked better. And look at this crime. The, we could talk about forever about all kinds of different things in this game, but oh man, what a crime. And one of the things that highlighted for me was uh, that when, when I, you know, expound at length about good pieces and bad pieces, I think a key reason why a lot of players don't um, feel what I'm saying intuitively is they haven't had someone punish them for a terrible piece. And I can just say, if you're playing some GM and you get this position, they're not going to take it. They're not going to take the knight. They're going to make you suffer for that poor beast. And like uh, Dor notes, bishop e7 and take, and, you know, takes an f6, and yes, there's a problem with the pawns, but more importantly, the knight is just absolutely terrible. Okay. So let's look. Dornow is able to turn this game around. And White just continues to make poor moves. Thank you very much. And now, well, we're going to say something like Dor is 
clearly better. Rook c6, uh, weird move. And a uh, whole mess happens here. Ooh, man. Rook takes f4. Very nice move. And uh, let's say the point is that if rook c6, we can play king g5. King e5 might work as well, but king g5 simply holds on to the rook. Okay, we will now proceed to Paul in New Jersey and his studies, his studies in pessimism. As <laughs> we've had Paul in New Jersey many times in the show. And, um, you know, the amazing thing, and I'm going to just, I'm going to read, if you've been on the show many times, if you listen to the show, you'll know that I'm repeating myself. But uh, uh, Paul in New Jersey is just an interesting specimen of a player where I think if you uh, go outside of chess now, there's all kinds of spectrums between pessimism and optimism. And for most parts of life, it isn't that helpful of a category to me of pessimism versus optimism. You know, um, from a life circumstance and a chess circumstance, I guess what you're talking about when you say it, though, is like when I find myself thrown into some convoluted situation, what is my hopefulness? What is my you know, just sense of hopefulness that I'll be able to figure it out? And what's interesting about chess players is, especially those that have made it, and really just those who enjoy chess, there has to be a certain amount of belief that you can figure it out. And, but that runs a spectrum. There are definitely various, uh, very strong GMs that are way too over-optimistic. Um, Kramnik at his final press conferences was like a really clear example of it. Luke Van Valey and others, you know, well, they'll, they'll say they're winning in positions where other people are like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? I don't get it. So, um, anyways, Paul New Jersey is an example of someone on the far end of the pessimism spectrum, and it does affect his play. Now, we can criticize... Paul New Jersey, and I've done it in the past about being too pessimistic, but I, I in a lot of ways, I don't know if that's going to, I don't know if that helps him uh, overcome his pessimism. Let's talk about it a little bit more when we get to these following positions. I love this variation for white. It's very interesting. And this is Fisher's highfalutin bishop f4 move. Uh, another very basic move, it's easier to play too, is just to play knight f3 here. Let him play bishop g4. Let him exchange it off. Fine. In this case, it's a her. Let her exchange it off. Uh, and what you have here is just a better Carlsbad structure uh, with reverse colors. Right? You can imagine this being a queen's gambit decline, but we just have more uh, tempi. And the idea is going to be long-term to use the e5 point in our attack against the king side. And that will become a theme in this game as well. So this was the whole highfalutin idea here is to not allow the bishop on g4 to be useful on the king side. And black in this game helps that cause by playing b6. And now looks b6 looks real suspicious but it basically means i think that the bishop will be will really have to retreat at some point back to d7 just to cover those weak light squares okay g6 knight gf3 and now a very strange move that i don't understand i don't understand it at all h5 when you see h5 you should become optimistic about your chances. B6 is also cause for optimism. Though given that the bishop on G4 can still go back, you know, we should say probably something like, oh, well, we're not going to be too over-optimistic yet. Uh, but H5, really not a good move. I don't get it. I think, uh, this is just speculation, but... Well, she's intending some kind of bishop h6 thing, 
And we saw that earlier on in, I think it was uh, Nicholas's game with bishop a6. And the problem with that is it takes time, and whatever piece lands on a a6 or h6 is going to require uh, Tempe to get itself out. Actually, we saw it also in Vishnu's game against Sam, a.k.a. Quirked, earlier on in the show. Okay, so uh, h3, okay. Bishop d7, and now you just have a great position where the move g6 is very suspect, uh, and the next intention of bishop h6 is also very suspect. Okay, should you have taken it on h6, Paul? Yes, of course you should have. And what I want to stress is it's not even so much about the castling, though that is a thing. It's that the rook on h6, oh my god, so terribly placed uh, for the rest of the game. And so, uh, I don't know if I can cure you of your optimism, but you, what you do, Paul, is you play a number of openings that are inherently have some attack in them like this one does. This one very much is about an attack. And what you need to realize is when your opponents play funky moves, which they're going to do, like h5 and bishop h6, b6, that's when your uh, sense of God's wrath of the big punishment for down, coming down from the sky, that's when it has to be there in order for you, for you just to enjoy the game. So bishop h6, of course. I, do I think you're winning after bishop h6? Yeah, winning position. Okay, weird. Also kind of weird. Could you take that bishop on f5? Absolutely. Don't be worried about rook g8. That thing's not doing anything to you. Okay. Black has stabilized the position, at least somewhat here. And the next move is criminal. Knight g f3. Oh, man, Paul, look, this knight is great. Not only is it looking at e6, but it's also looking into the black king position and covering any kind of knight e4 business. So, yeah, if you're a little optimistic, especially about your attack here, you should say, oh, I want that knight to stay on g5. Chess lover, hello! And um, one thing to see about this Carlsbad structure is that even with diminished uh, material, you can have fantastic opportunities against the black king. And h5 is actually a potential lever for us with a later g4. And we will at some point use that e5 square to attack the king. This pawn, by the way, pointing towards the king's side. Let's also say that these pawns are dominating this knight. It's a terrible, terrible piece. So better moves in this position would have been rook e1, knight d f3. You could even consider knight e6. It might seem absurd to you, but the king will always be on the run. But honestly, no rush. With rook e1, you could do it next move if you want to. Okay, so, uh, by the way, there's some great YouTube videos where Carlson plays this position. He plays this structure, and it can happen out of a variety of openings. And he just makes very strong GMs look like fools because he ends up coming with an attack onto the king. All right, what's happened now is you're gradually stabilizing the black position by not having taken advantage of all of your beauty. Now, this move is not in itself terrible rook eighty one, but I want to stress the queen wants to come back. So I should have chastised you for queen b5 as well. I realize you were hunting something over there that can't be hunted, right? But the queen wants to be on the king's side to do to to go after the king, and in fact, in the blitz game, I, off the top of my head, I can't nail it. You know which game it was, but Carlson just like calmly brought the queen back, playing this, and then started crushing the fool. Okay, so 
It'd be nice actually if our YouTube videos were searchable by opening name. And point I wanted to make is you are strong pointing e5. So rook a d1 doesn't have to do with e5. I want everything to line up with e5. And so if we're going to move a rook, it's going to be rook e3. Very powerful move. This will go here. This will go here. Strong point. We're threatening. Th well, we will later threaten things like knight g6. We will later play g4, rook h3, and play for mate. It's a brutal system. So again, despite what seems what might seem to be reduced material, this is a very violent position still for um, white. And nota bene, the pawn on g6, a monster weakness. And a lot of players would play h4, h5, snip, just to get the opportunity to get ready to pile on the e-file, sack on g6, boom, crush through on e6. Mm. We want a banana made by iced coffee. It is very nice. It's very nice. I haven't been drinking as much of it as I'd like. I've been talking my mouth off for hours here. All right, let's go to the game. So, knight d7. And now your opponent plays a nice move. Knight e5. Okay. We're, we're, you know, should you play queen e2 to keep the queens on? Yes. Yes. In fact, let's, I, I, we, let's make a point of that. In this position, I still like white a lot. You still very much, I want to really stress it, very much have attacking prospects on the king side. They go like this, rook e5, rook e1. We strong point that business. Then we bust with g4 or queen g3, queen f4. Oh, man. Notice it's very difficult for black to get her defensive resources onto your side of the board. In the meantime, yes, she will probably try to do some kind of minority attack. But unfortunately for her, the most she can win over there is a pawn while you can go after the king. Okay, so here we go. And now, I guess I, I don't know who's better. I guess I'd rather be uh, b black. I don't know, though. But in the next couple moves, we're going to get uh, kind of a passive position from you. And you need to understand that it's time to play either a move like a4 to slow down black's business or to start with like king h2 g4 to start your own drama on the king side knight e5 and you're absolutely right now the rook is not nearly as impressive because we don't have the attacking oomph to go after the king and now that h5 move is no longer a mistake a problem in the position for her uh, she takes her time in developing the minority attack, uh, but it's eventually going to be successful. Like, for example, b5 right now certainly makes sense. Uh, in this particular position, I, I'm glad Vishnu's gone from the show because he would be criticizing me because normally I usually don't like the minority attack as an option. But in this particular position, the main thing to see about the move b5 is, more than anything, we are trying to activate our rooks by opening stuff up on the c-file. Okay, so here we go. All right. How bad is it for white? <laughs> it's, it's getting pretty gnarly. It's getting pretty gnarly, and the main thing is not the pawn weakness. It is that uh, uh, our pieces, our, our pieces, aka our rooks, are very passive. So this is already a position of big massage for black against the good Paul in New Jersey. A little too late, as you write. And we got to say this position must be lost. Those those two rooks just way too powerful. Yeah, and I'm just assuming this is lost here. I like that you eventually... Look at this. Now, by the way, in desperation, players activate their business. But it's only after they come to the point of like no return. 
And that's common. I feel like that's often the case, is that people only get active after things have horrifically gone downhill. Unfortunately, that was necessary. Otherwise, we would have wanted to play king f6. And the problem was hg, of course. And now we're just getting thrown back. And I guess it's all over. I'm assuming it's all over here. Okay, Paula, New Jersey. It's always interesting. We have next kind of an interesting thing. Let me go back to our uh, program here. What we have here is um, the uh, final three games, and I've labeled them all improvement. And two of the players, Jacob and Carter, are new to the show. And uh, Ricker is coming in third. Now, I just want to, one reason I wanted to frame it like this is that Ricker has been doing this show many times. And what I want to really, what I want Jacob and Carter to see is they might feel, Jacob and Carter, that they are not up to the level of the other games on this show. And what I want to assure him is they're going to see a game from Ricker later where Ricker plays a a beautiful game at a pretty high level. We'll look at that last. Ricker, by the way, is in Indonesia, so he's I, I'm pretty sure he's not able to watch this show right now because it's too late. Uh, but I want Jacob and Carter to know is that the kinds of mistakes that they are going to make, and I'm going to chastise, are the same ones that Ricker made for months. And really, I think, through discipline and applying what I said, um, was able to raise his level. So hopefully what we'll, I'll yell at Jacob and Carter a little bit and then we'll see Ricker as kind of like an end product of where you can go if you start off on a level of whether it's 800, 1,000, 1,200, where you can go by an annotating your games. And again, what I want to stress is this business of annotating games is simply not just for higher rated players. It's for everybody. And one thing I want to point out is a lot of times people will submit games to the forum and they'll just have like a note or two and it'll be like a five minute game and they'll be like, check this out. And no, I don't do it. And, I, and a lot of times those games are not by strong players and it feels maybe like I'm excluding them. But that's not the point. In fact, Jacob and Carter both wrote pretty good notes about their games, even if these games contain a lot of what other players, the Mitch and Vishnu's of the world, might see as elementary mistakes. So again, I want to stress I will cover any game that people put out here, uh, as long as they annotate it, and it needs to be at a, you know, not just some blitz game, but something where you've thought about, you know, you had opportunity to think during the game. Um, and that this process of analyzing the games, again, it's for everybody. All right, uh, this is not Mark, but this is Jacob is white against his old man, and his old man's gonna make some mistakes, but let's check it out. Inaccurate move as you write, the center pawns start rolling. Night before that, knight is in danger of getting knocked. Okay, knight f3. And Jacob correctly writes, blunder on his part. Could have played, uh, should have played e5. And honestly then, the game, I guess we're going to say, strategically won. Because, oh man, that, that, that looks like a good position. By the way, whatever you do, don't take that knight. That would be an example of somebody who thinks that pawns are people. They think that, Oh, I'm, I'm wrecking the pawns. But what they really are wrecking is the opportunity to dominate that terrible, terrible beast on a6. Keep him there. All right, here we go. c6. Again, a mistake. But actually, uh, you know, in this position, it's kind of funny. I didn't intend it this way, but we have a slightly similar idea that we had in the earlier game, oh, I'm struggling to remember, but Masia's game uh, over here in the Alakai. Let me just go through those moves. Also a pawn sacrifice 
and one where we get that big fat pawn on e5. Okay. So, blunder. We take it. And like I said, I might, might, your old man might feel bad about the fact that he hung a piece or whatever, but like I'm saying, Ricker was making similar mistakes in his games. And as you wrote, Bishop F7 mate would have been stronger. Okay. Beautiful stuff. Now, you're, now you got your old man. It is over, my friends. Bam. Okay, Jacob, thank you very much. Let's check out Carter's game. Now, by the way, I didn't go through all the notes. You can read them yourself. They're also on the forum. But I really think just writing it out, regardless of your level, you will get stronger. All right, this is Carter, first time on the show. And knight d4. This is a, a, kind of a typical mistake. I remember vividly uh, studying chess back in the day before the computer and wondering what the problem with this move is. On the surface, you know, you're creating a situation where you're saying, oh, the queen it shouldn't be moved out too early. Or as they say in the movie, Searching for Bobby Fisher, as uh, Lawrence Fishburne says, move the queen out, Josh, move the queen out. <laughs> but in this position with the queen on d4, uh, it's a developing move, and it really can't be harassed in any meaningful way, and it has great scope throughout the board. Uh, later in queen endgames, a thing that's very useful to say in the queen ending is you want your queen centralized, and that's really what we get here. As long as that queen can't be harassed, it's a centralized queen. So e6, and now snip. And so what's going to happen now is... I think, Carter, you have a... I think Carter's your last name, but I'm just going to call you Carter. Is that you have a sense that you are damaging the pawn structure. But pawns are not people, and your queen was developed, and uh, that bishop on g5 was developed, and so you're going to let him trade it off, and now I, I'm going to say black is okay. Yeah. Black is, in fact, fine in this position. And I think most GMs, if you will, strong players, would say they'd rather be black because the two bishops are nice. Let's look at what happened. King b8, probably not necessary, not bad. Okay. Okay. A3. And this is an example of a move, I think, where you don't know what to do. And I get it, right? So uh, let me just say that uh, what you should, you can ask yourself, well, okay, cry, well, what am I supposed to do then? You should be thinking about improving this knight, right? Uh, because it's not doing anything, and something like knight e2, d4, for example, comes to mind, and you might have to organize that a little bit, but that could be an intention. And a3, as far as I can tell, doesn't really intend anything. f5, king b1, I'm not sure. Not sure the king wants to go there. He might want to be in the center, in fact. We've talked a little bit about that before. Um, a good saying is don't take the pinned piece. And what that means is the pawn on e4 can't move. Furthermore, the knight on c3 is bad. Let's just note this. That a6 was a nice move to take away the square from the knight. This square is also taken away from the knight. And really... A key idea for black in this structure is just to take away squares from the white pieces. And what this does, Fe, is it frees the knight from all of its horribleness. I would definitely consider d5 here. And now, now the knight is good, right? Now the knight's doing stuff. Now the knight's doing stuff. And here... I hadn't intended this, but we have a, a return to the very early idea in the game of actually, look at this move, bam, taking, taking two pieces, two pawns for a piece. In this position, I'm going to say that can't be right. Can't be right. For one, your knight is a beautiful piece here. What a great piece. No reason to flip out. And if it needed to come back, you can always even play knight e4. There's no, um, 
you know, that pawn on d5 is pinned. So right, now black blunders should of course take, and uh, I guess we're going to say black is winning in that position. Something like this, and I don't know, king c7. King's better, bishop's better, the whole thing. Your opponent blunders. And here I'm going to say, yeah, you should be winning. You got two extra pawns and the better rook. And let's just classify this as a terrible, terrible mistake. Uh, in general, a good rule of thumb is that the pawn endings with a pawn ahead are going to be winning. And really, you just have a pawn now because black has fixed you with this terrible g3 weakness. I.e., you can't easily make a pass pawn anymore on the king's side. Good. Well played. Yeah, there you go. All right. Beautiful game, Carter. And let's take a look at Ricker. I swear to God, this is a true story. Uh, Ricker was making the same level of mistakes as Carter and Jacob. And check out this game that he's making now. Okay, here we go. Car uh, Ricker, by the way, an older guy. So it's especially uh, good that we're seeing him play, uh, it, make progress. It's very difficult. Okay, so what has happened? We have transposed from a Sicilian to an advanced French and this particular advanced French, we're going to say, is a better version for white because if you imagine the pawn on c5 and c pawns on c5 and c3, then what we can say is that the pawn on c3 really is in white's way because he couldn't play knight c3, but now he can. Okay, Injun says knight e7 is better. I agree. But f6 is interesting, and it creates some questions about what um, white should do. I think he should play bishop d3. This is my first reaction. Snip, snip. And now we have really a French structure. And Rickers played totally solidly here. And... There's a couple points, Ricker, but I'm going to just point out to things that I guess we're going to say I wish you had talked about a little bit. Um, in particular, like, why is this bishop b5 a bad move? And, the, and we just, I just want you to note, just say out loud, oh, it's a terrible move because black has one bad piece, the bishop on c8, and otherwise, uh, that's it. And now black's better developed, too, when that trade happens. Now, why did White do this? Because he thought that pawns were people, and he gave up his amazing bishop on e5, his only good piece, to take on f6 with the thought that, hey, now maybe these pawns are weakened. Instead, now black is better, and oh my, oh my. Now we have ourselves a, a classic uh, French ending, I've had this myself a couple times. And what is it? It's bishop and a bishop, a fisher ending, bishop and rook against the knight. And I thought you I thought you handled this pretty well. In addition to that, we have a theme of the show, which is going to be two connected pawns in the center. And like we've said, the goal is for those pawns to dominate the one or more of the white pieces. And in this case, I think we're not in any hurry to play e5. It's, they're just kind of cool where they are. We want our pawns on light and our bishop on dark so that the pawns do the work of covering the light squares and our bishop does the work of covering the dark squares. Uh, I, I would just say I'm not a great fan of bishop e4 just because I never, never, never want to take the thing. Uh, a6 would be a nice move to dominate the bishop, the, the knight. But essentially, we're going to get the same position. I love that you didn't take the, the knight. Could you have taken the knight and had, had a better position? Yes. By the way, just other things, just to note in your annotations next time, Ricker. Castle's not a great move. Same mistake that Vishnu made earlier on. Anytime you're in an endgame, 
and you're about to castle, say to yourself, wait a second, <laughs> wait a second. I know my hand instinctively wants to castle, but I need to slow it down and think about maybe not castling. Domination, A6. Now, when you first started coming on this show, you were not playing moves of the quality of A6. Just very nice. Bishop D6. Very nice. Why? Because the bishop is stronger than the knight, especially in this position. Let's do some dogmatism. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. In contrast, the white knight on c3 is controlling the same amount of, the most amount of squares it will ever control, which is eight. And furthermore, actually I didn't intend this, but this similar has similarities to the structure with Carter in the last game, where your pawns in the light squares are stopping all of white's key knight moves, right? So very nice domination. And again, uh, actually it goes back to Vishnu, what I said about Vishnu's game. When you've got the bishop, look for ways to put the pawns on the opposite color so that you get the full grip on the board. And you can see it here. The, you've got control everywhere. Whole thing, you're controlling it all. Okay, rook a c1, b5. I'm a little, little unhappy with b5. I'd rather see rook a c8. I'm unhappy with f5, just because I don't think he's actually threatening too big to play f5 himself, but I'm going to take it back. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. f5. You're fixing the pawn f4. I get it. Uh, now the... Okay. Yeah. Fine. b4. Strange. Strange for him to do that. Good move. Good move. Kind of strange. I want you to play things like a5 and rook b8. Again, why are you better? There are plus, there are past, there's action on both sides of the board. Your king is better, and the Fisher ending, let me just point out, is a very simple concept. It's that the bishop is better than the knight in general, but the problem with the bishop is it doesn't control the opposite color. In this case, the rook is going to complement the bishop uh, by controlling the other color. Uh, if you want a way to think about it, you can think about human evolution and us using dogs. It was beneficial to the dogs and it was beneficial to us. Likewise, the bishop and the rook like to go together. They're like the, like the humans and the dogs, they create to form a team of immense attacking potential. I hope you enjoyed that one. Okay, <laughs> here we go, knight a4, h4, Rook g8. You're getting a little fancy, but I love that you say pawns aren't people. And I love that you're writing h3 is a wrong move. Right, because this allows him to get g3. Are you still better? Yes, but we didn't want him to have that. And with rook g4, one of the interesting things that you would have gotten after rook g4 is really a full um, thing where the pawns are going to be rolling on both sides. It will be complicated and will be a little scary because those pawns on the queen side can induce fear in anybody. But since the pawns are really rolling everywhere, we should really believe in the bishop. Plus, it's nice that your king and your rook are better. Snip. All right. Rook b1, probably wrong, because now look at this one. Bam, c3. And that's a pretty, I'm going to call that a pretty standard pattern. c3 there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really great game, Ricker. So I want to stress, I think this game shows tremendous progress. And anybody can go back and look in the forums. And before it was like, let me put it this way. When anyone's starting out in chess, they kind of need to first master the the first dimension of the game, which is material, how to not drop pieces. And we saw at the beginning of Ricker's adventure on this show that he was dropping a lot of pieces. The next level of dimension of chess is time. And what we saw is Ricker was giving up time. And I said, no, buddy, not on my show. You're not going to be giving up time. And that stopped. 
And what we're seeing now is a far more uh, developed kind of chess being played by Ricker. And of course, he's still making mistakes. We're all making mistakes. But the mistakes are of a much different variety than they were before. And he's putting away pretty good opposition now. So just inspirational, especially for us old guys. I count myself among them to make some progress. All right. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to sign off. I will be here on the 30th of September, I'm assuming, uh, for the next show. There will be a forum put up by the chess.com gnomes uh, in the next day or two, and you can submit your game there. All right. Bye, everybody.